Uh, so one of the stated purposes of this meeting is to share ideas about what happens at Planck scale. And I didn't know what happens at Planck scale. And one of the purposes of this talk is to share my <laughs> lack of understanding about this. But to be more serious, um, the reason why nobody knows what happens at Planck scale is that we all believe that uh, quantum field theory approach to uh, gravity does not make sense. Uh, quantum gravity is non-renormalizable and th well, the real purpose of this talk is to try to reevaluate the status of QFT approach to quantum gravity in light of some recent developments. It has been realized in the last 10 years that uh, there is a deep relationship between uh, gravity and the Mills theory. And so I'll try to explain you these new facts in as much details as I can. And the main message I want to give it from the very beginning is that um, it now seems more and more that uh, the quantum field theory uh, that we have discarded as terribly complicated and not making sense, well, it's related, deeply related, and in many ways analogous to uh, the simplest and best quantum field theory we have, Jan Mills. Um, so I'll, I'll give you all these facts and I'll let you make your own decision about, the, about interpreting these facts. Uh, but so maybe, maybe there is some, maybe there is still some, maybe it's still too premature to bury the quantum field theory approach to quantum gravity. This is what I would like to suggest in this talk, but let me, let me continue to the facts. So the plan will be, I'll uh, start very quickly reviewing the old story, then I'll talk about gravity as Jan Mills squared, uh, then I'll talk briefly about my own work, which is describing gravity as particular diffeomorphism in the ion gauge theory, and I'll also talk about uh, new results about two-loop divergence in quantum gravity. So let's start with GR. Uh, this is the einstein hilbert functional. Uh, the basic thing to remember about GR, and which is I'm going to emphasize it again and again in this talk, is the GR uniqueness. Uh, GI is the unique diffeomorphism invariant gauge theory, or oh, sorry, GI is the unique uh, diffeomorphism invariant theory of the metric with second order field equations. Uh, one can, uh, well, this, this statement doesn't quite have a status of a theorem, but later on I will give uh, a s more powerful statement, which is e much easier to prove, which basically says that this is the correct statement. So, uh, GI is unique. Uh, points to emphasize about GI is that GI Lagrangian uh, is unlike all other Lagrangians we're used to. Uh, GI Lagrangian is linear in acceleration. Other, for other physical theories, uh, like Ian Mills or anything else we're used to, uh, Lagrangian is non-linear in velocity. Right? GI Lagrangian is sorry. GL Lagrangian is linear in second derivatives of the metric. Uh, another point about Einstein Hilbert is that uh, the condition, uh, the instanton condition, GI has an instanton sector, and uh, the instanton condition, unlike, for example, in Jan Mills theory, this instanton condition is second order in derivatives. Instanton condition is that the, vial, the part of the vial curvature vanishes. It's second order condition. So this is all unlike other theories. Then let's quickly look at the linearization. Uh, this is GI Lagrangian linearized around flat space. Uh, well, this can be dis derived uh, without knowing Einstein with Lagrangian just by demanding that we're constructing something uh, second order in derivatives. Uh, it's a function of the metric perturbation and it should be invariant under linearized diffeomorphisms. Then this is a unique construct, construct modular surface terms with these properties. Uh, another interesting point about this is that, well, this is quite a complicated object, first of all. Uh, importantly, it's not, uh, even in Euclidean signature, this is not of definite sign, the two different signs in these terms. And certainly, this is not a square, the, the operator, second order differential operator that arises here, is certainly not a square of any first order operator, unlike, for example, in Jan Mills theory. Uh, let's talk about interactions. Uh, schematically, well, first of all, uh, GL Lagrangian is second order in derivatives. Any vertex will have two derivatives in it. 
therefore, schematically, cubic vertex has this form. You immediately see that uh, just by counting dimensions that the coupling constant in front uh, is 1 over m. So it has negative mass dimension, and therefore, this theory is going to be power counting non normalizable because of so many derivatives in the vertex, uh, for example, 2 to 2 graviton scattering amplitude is going to grow with energy. And therefore, there is apparent breakdown of perturbative unitarity at energy surround Planck scale, which is the textbook way of stating uh, the reason why quantum gravity probably doesn't make sense. But actually, just this fact, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it to bury the theory, uh, because there may be some non-perturbative resummation mechanism. It may be that uh, this object is just a part of some series expansion. Maybe it sums up to something that does make sense. So by itself, I wouldn't call it the reason why quantum gravity doesn't make sense. Um, let's look at expansion, further terms in the expansion. This is uh, formulas from a Gorov Sagnoti Tulu paper. They're just here to illustrate how complicated GL Lagrangian becomes if expanded. This expansion is around an arbitrary background, but if you, even if you set the background to be flat, uh, which would kill all these terms, there's still lots of terms in the cubic vertex. So the full vertex function, uh, vertex factor, which you would have to use in calculations, is about 100 terms, even in flat space. And the quartic vertex is horrible. So it's, it, it is a com very complicated structure. Uh, but let's, uh, in spite of these complications, there is still some, something very interesting happens at one loop. In spite of being very badly divergent, this theory is actually finite at one loop. Uh, this is true uh, for GR not coupled to any matter, so pure GR with zero cosmological constant and in four dimensions. Uh, all the divergences go away. Of course, you have to use some field redefinitions, uh, but uh, for physical uh, quantities, there are no divergence at one loop in pure GR. When lambda is not equal to zero, the divergence that there is some divergence that arises, but it can be reabsorbed into uh, the tree level action. So lambda equal to zero GR is actually finite at one loop. Lambda not equal to zero GR is renormalizable at one loop. Um, originally, well, now there is a very simple understanding of why this happens. We probably all know that there is a simple way of looking at what the divergences are and analyzing. And indeed, it's very easy to understand why this diversion doesn't happen. Uh, originally, this raised hopes that maybe these miracles continue at higher loops. But then explicit, I would call it heroic, calculation at two loops showed that uh, the theory does diverge at two loops. There is a non-zero result for these two-loop divergence. And I would call this the real reason why GR does not make sense as QFT, because at two loops, it's non normalizable And this is why we're all here. This is why we discuss different approaches to physics at Planck scale. Uh, let's compare it to the situation in Jan Mills quickly. Jan Mills Lagrangian is F squared. Uh, it's useful to look at linearization. Uh, linearization, it's enough to understand linearization of Maxwell, because uh, Jan Mills at linearized level is just Maxwell tensor Lie algebra. So Maxwell is based on this Deram complex. Uh, Lagrangian is just uh, the exterior derivative of a one form squared. Uh, in four space time dimensions, there is some additional structure uh, because the space of two forms, the field strength is a two form. The space of two forms splits into self dual, anti self dual two forms. And then it's very easy to see that. In fact, instead of writing dA squared, one can write d plus A squared, uh, modular surface term. This is the same. So Maxwell equations in vacuum uh, can be written as this statement. Uh, d plus star, which is this, uh, d this operator, d plus A is equal to zero. This is useful because then it splits uh, the solutions of Maxwell equations into two sectors. Uh, as you can see, uh, this first order equation implies the second order equation. And th then these objects are called negative helicity photons. So in four space time dimensions, one can introduce negative and positive helicity. And they're also kind of self dual and anti self dual objects. This is convenient. Uh, importantly, 
you see that linearized uh, field equations, the operator that arises is a square of some first order operator. It's a very, very simple structure. And there is some also, there is some complex behind it. Uh, Jan Mills interactions, uh, there is just one derivative in Jan Mills cubic vertex. For this reason, the coupling constant is dimensionless. Uh, theory is much less divergent than GR because there are less derivatives. Uh, dimensionless coupling, therefore, we may expect renormalizability. The theory diverges at one loop, uh, and the divergence can be shown to be related to the beta function. This is the famous result. Uh, I like to state it in this way. Uh, instead of writing the beta function for G, it's, for, well, I, I like to state it as the fact that uh, the coefficient in front of the action uh, grows in the UV logarithmically. It becomes bigger and bigger in the ultraviolet. And this is interpreted as asymptotic freedom. Uh, so summary of what I have s I've said so far. Jan Mills is a very nice theory. It's perfect theory. It's a UV complete theory. It's probably the best quantum field theory that we have. Gravity is a complete mess. Uh, and there's certainly no relation between the two. It's just different worlds. But there are also glimpses of uh, GR being not just a random non-normalizable theory. Uh, first of all, GR uniqueness is very powerful, strong fact. GI is clearly unique. There is something special about it. So it's not just random theory. And also, we have one loop finiteness result in four space time dimensions. This also tells you that there is something special about GR. OK, let me continue with the new story. The new story, well, it has been developing over the last 20 years, increasingly so in the last 10 years. Over the last 20 years, uh, this is mainly Bern and uh, people around him developing on shell techniques for doing uh, calculations in quantum field theory. Uh, in the last 10 years, after the Witten's paper on string, uh, on twisted string for Jan Mills, many people joined the community and started developing on-shell techniques. And th so this resulted in some new understanding of gravity in particular, and some aspects of this I will tell you. So the new understanding is that uh, it's sometimes very, very powerful uh, to instead of looking at the Lagrangian and the rising Feynman rules, uh, look at only on-shell objects. And on-shell objects are the scattering amplitudes. And then in many cases, uh, scattering amplitudes can be completely determined from rather minimal input. Basically, the point is that often you don't need a Lagrangian. And then why is this conceptually, why does it give some conceptually new understanding? Well, first of all, you can produce uh, new simple proofs of GI and the Mills uniqueness. These are proofs that work at, uh, with on-shell quantities only, with scattering amplitudes. And indeed, you can convince yourself very, very quickly that uh, well, GI is the only interacting theory of massless spin to particles with second-order field equations just by looking at scattering amplitudes. Yes? Huh? In four dimensions. In four dimensions. This is true statement. I, I, in this talk, I'm in four dimensions. I'm, yeah, I should say in the beginning that I'm in four dimensions here. Of course, in higher dimensions, you have lock, love block theories as well. And again, th these are very, very simple proofs. They leave absolutely no doubt about this uniqueness statement. While at the, if you work with the Lagrangian field, then you have to deal with field definitions. It's a much more complicated story. At the on-shell level, there is absolutely no question that this is true. Uh, another very, very striking fact is that uh, at on-shell level, uh, there is there turned out to be a relation between Jan Mills amplitude and gravity amplitude. There are many different ways to state this fact. Uh, this fact is often called gravity is equal to Jan Mills squared. There are many different versions of this, but for purposes of this talk, I'll just state one, which I find personally the most striking. Uh, it's called uh, color kinematics duality, and it was discovered by Bernd Krasko and Johansson in 2008. So uh, the first statement is that one can write Jan Mills amplitudes in a very particular way. Uh, here is my Jan Mills on shell scattering amplitude, and the right hand side is not what would come from Feynman rules. This is important to emphasize. 
First of all, it's the sum of just trivalent graphs, while in uh, five minerals will give you also four valent contributions. You can, uh, with some tricks, split the four valent vertex of Jan Mills as a product of two cubic vertices, but even if you do that, you will, well, you'll obtain some of our cubic graphs, but then some other structure that is here, you will not obtain it from fine minerals. So this is not what comes, comes from fine minerals. But it's very, well, tree valent. This is tree level only, first of all. This is, it's only, this is a statement. Uh, there are also some generalizations valid at loop level, but they're much less understood. And at tree level, this is a fact that uh, on-shell scattering amplitudes can be written in this form. But I didn't explain you everything yet. So it's the sum of the trees, uh, tree valent uh, trees. Then these are uh, Lie algebra structure constants. Then these are kinematic numerators. Basically, if you remember, there is a derivative in every cubic uh, vertex of Jan Mills, and this derivative would go there. It, this, this object would, well, it would be linear in momentum. It would have mass dimension one. And then there the are propagators. So uh, at this level, uh, Feynman diagrams would give you such an expression if you split the four valent vertex. But then the important point here is that uh, these kinematic numerators are not arbitrary. They are required, or they have the property, that they satisfy the same Jacobi identity as uh, the structure constants of Lie algebra. Right? The structure constants satisfy Jacobi identities, and this ends satisfy the same Jacobi identity. So this is what makes this representation strange. Uh, such a description is known to be correct at tree level. It's a fact that one can write on-shell amplitudes in this way. This is not explained by Feynman diagrams at all. So you, you have no explanation for this fact from, from the action principle. Uh, another po possibly relevant fact that this, the choice of numerators is not unique different choices. Uh, why is this fact, why is this representation so interesting? One can show that it implies some new identities, some new relations between the so-called color ordered, color ordered amplitudes in Jan Mills. So it's this, the fact that one can write amplitudes in this way is powerful. It implies some new identities. But uh, for purposes of this talk, the most interesting reason why, the most important reason why this is interesting is that if you know such a representation for Jan Mills amplitude, then you can immediately write down a gravity amplitude in the way you simply take uh, the structure constant and replace it with another copy of n. So, indeed, gravity becomes Jan Mills squared, where you simply strip off color and replace it with another copy of kinematics. And this is, a, I mean, it's a fact. Jan Mills on shell scattering amplitude, uh, gravity on shell scattering amplitudes can be written in this way. Uh, there is understanding of gravity equal to Jan Mills squared coming from string theory, where you embed everything in string theory and then you open closed string duality. You use open closed string duality. Uh, then uh, there is an explanation of this sort for, for why this works, but there is certainly no explanation from the Lagrangian point of view and from Feynman diagram point of view. So I would say nobody really understands why it works. If you just take two theories on there, as they are, there is no understanding. Um, then some remarks. Uh, so we see that the worst possible Q of T, which is gravity, appears to be the square of the best possible Q of T, which is Jan Mills. I find this fact very striking. Um, Another important point uh, about on-shell methods is that if you use on-shell methods, you start to realize that gravity is actually not as bad as it seems from the Einstein-Hilbert point of view. Einstein-Hilbert expanded gives you horrible mass, but if you use on-shell techniques, gravity is not much more, com actually it's not com more complicated than Jan Mills at all. It, it behaves very, very similar to Jan Mills theory. Another very important fact about gravity is that it has a very powerful group gauge of gauge symmetries, diffeomorphisms. The reason why it's powerful, if you compare Jan, what happens in Jan Mill, uh, sorry, what happens in Maxwell, in Maxwell you have one generator of gauge symmetries per space-time point. In gravity you have four generators per space-time point. So in that sense it's more powerful. 
and actually it does uh, uh, it manifests itself as a more powerful gauge symmetry uh, it can be understood that well it does have implications uh, so in particular one of the implications is that uh, gravity amplitudes when continued into the complex plane in a certain way actually have much uh, stronger fall-off behavior at infinity in the complex plane than any other theory. So I, I, I don't have time to explain this, but under the so-called BCFW shifts, for example, Jan Mills amplitudes go uh, fall-off as 1 over z at infinity, while gravity follows us as 1 over z squared. So in, in, in a certain sense, gravity is the softest theory in the UV under this type of analytic continuation. So it, and, and th this can be traced just to, to the fact that the gauge group of gravity is diffeomorphisms. And then another fact relevant for this discussion is that um, there are, if you start computing loops, uh, you find that there are some unexpected cancellations happening at loop level. This has been mostly explored in the context of supergravity by Bern and collaborators, but there is something strange happening with gravity at loop level. It, yeah. Mm, no, I would. Mm, no, 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 no. I, I think the, the real understanding is different morphisms. There is just more gauge on this, is why it happens. Because of diffuse, yeah. Okay, uh, let me continue to new developments part two. Actually, this is my personal work, and this is what I, I have been developing for the last years. Uh, it turns out that gravity can also be reformulated in some exotic way. Uh, so in the de new de developments part one, I talked about on-shell techniques. Here, gravity will be reformulated off-shell in some exotic way. So what is exotic here? Uh, it will be theory of connections rather than metrics, dynamical theory of connections rather than metrics. And why is this relevant for this talk? Because it makes GR quite analogous to Jan Mills in many senses, and I'll explain what the analogies are. Um, what is this reformulation? So let's start again with GR. GR is the only construct that we can make, the only dynamical theory of metrics, uh, which is diff invariant, right? So the idea here is to write some diffeomorphism invariant theory of connections uh, with second order field equations. So there is no metric, there are just connections. We want to make them dynamical, we want second order field equations, and we want diff invariance. So that's the only requirements, that's the only input that uh, we do. And it turns out that any such theory will contain gravity. It will contain interacting massless spin to particles. And a particular theory of this sort is GR. That's the idea. Uh, how can we construct gauge, uh, diff invariant gauge theories? Well, uh, gauge theory, the basic field is a gauge field. Uh, we want it to be gauge invariant, so we better construct our Lagrangian from field strengths, which transforms very simply under gauge transformations. But then we don't have any other, we don't have any background structure, so we just have this gauge field. Uh, a field strengths is a two form, it has space time indices mu nu. We need to contract the space time indices in some way to form a scalar. The only object that we have is the epsilon tensor. Um, therefore, the only way to contract uh, space-time indices of f is to take f mu nu, f or sigma, and use the epsilon tensor to contract all four indices into epsilon tensor. This is the only way to deal with space-time indices. Uh, said, it, said differently, uh, we have to consider objects f wedge f because f contracted into epsilon is just f wedge f. So this leaves us, this eats all space-time indices, but uh, have, we still have Lie algebra indices free. And with Lie algebra indices we can do many more things because we have metric invariant metric in the Lie algebra, we have structure constants, and this is where possibilities come from. So uh, then the idea is to consider uh, functions, scalar-valued functions on two copies is of Lie algebra. Uh, it's a symmetric tensor product because f wedge f is a symmetric object. And then 
f which f already has the right density weight uh, uh, to be e to be able to integrate it. it it transforms correctly under diffeomorphism so we want a uh, function uh, of f which f to be homogeneity degree one and then we want it to be gauge invariant and if you have such a function then you can apply it to f which f and it will be well-defined for form which you can integrate one can quickly convince yourself that there are lots of such functions so this is not a problem but any interesting such function importantly it will be non-polynomial in f which f because the only polynomial object one can construct is a trace of f which f and trace of f which f integrated is just some topological number depending on the bundle so anything one has that is interesting here is non-polynomial in f that's an important point to keep in mind uh, I would call these theories diffeomorphism in the gauge theories because this is what they are uh, uh, these Lagrangians lead to second order field equations basically because Lagrangian is just a function of first derivatives of the connection there are no dimensionful couplings here because well, basically f which f already has the right dimension and therefore the function of f which f if you expand it there will be no dimensionful couplings there there are only dimensionless parameters uh, another important point any such theory is always non normalizable by power counting simply because of non polynomiality if we start expanding eventually well there is a sufficiently high power of f appearing and therefore it's non normalizable by power counting and then the important point is that linearization around the appropriate background of any such theory will always contain gravitons this I don't have time to explain but it's true uh, but I'll explain something else uh, I'll explain why for a particular choice of gauge group namely SO3 or SU2 these theories are gravity theories that I can explain uh, to get gravity uh, we need to understand what metric is so imagine we just have some theory of gauge fields which propagate on our manifold which do which have some dynamics but there is certainly no metric structure and then I want to introduce metric interpretation of these theories so I'll simply use my gauge field and define a metric from it uh, this definition of the metric is geometric uh, and so maybe this is a bit non-trivial but it's a very simple geometric fact that I want you to digest and the geometric fact is that if you have uh, uh, three two forms on your four-dimensional manifolds then there is a unique metric which makes these three two forms self-dual uh, this metric is related to the fact that if you know which forms are self-dual on your manifold then you know conformal metric um, metric modular conformal rescalings and well the m more sophisticated mathematical uh, explanation of this fact is this isomorphism of groups but basically if you know as I said if you know three two forms you write down you can write down explicit expression for conformal metric and then uh, this is the reason why SU2 gauge theories can be given metric interpretation because for SU2 Lie algebra is three-dimensional and therefore curvature of our connection uh, is a collection of three two forms we can declare these three two forms to be self-dual and this gives us a conformal metric in which they are self-dual so this, this is just conformal metric and then to complete the definition of the metric I need to tell you what the conformal factor is uh, but uh, if we have a theory uh, theories, theory comes with a particular with a given four form right it's our f of f which f so we declare that to be the volume form so that our action is just the volume total volume of the space uh, this is definition of the metric and then uh, one can show that any such theory actually there, there are many different functions even for SU2 and one can show that any such uh, diffeomorphism invariant SU2 gauge theory expanded around appropriate background linearization is always the same so it's, it just describes gravitons Yes, actually, it turns out that the field equation here, Euler Lagrange equation of this theory, is just the compatibility condition. 
mm, if you do this, uh, you get high derivative action, clearly. So, well, uh, you, you see. Uh, huh? No, this is definitely a completely different action. Completely different action. I'll explain a bit more on this in one of the next slides. Okay, well, let's, I'll, ex I'll say a bit more on this in the next slides. But here, important point is that any such theory is actually theory of gravitons, and a particular theory of this sort is GR. So what is that particular theory? Well, this is this strange choice of a function. It's trace of the square root squared. It turns out that that particular function of FHF gives you GR. One way to understand where this particular function comes from is via first order formulation of GR. You take certain first order formulation in which you have this connection, SU2 connection, and some other objects, which is one can think about them as metric. Uh, if you integrate out the connection, you're back to Einstein Hilbert, but you can also integrate out this metric, and then you'll obtain this strange function of connection. It only works importantly if lambda is non zero. This integrating out the metric is only possible for non-zero cosmological constant. So this gauge formulations of GR are only possible with non-zero lambda. And you see this because there is one over lambda in front. You cannot integrate. In, in this way of explaining things, I told you, you start with metric and a connection. You can only integrate out the metric if you have non-zero lambda. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's a coefficient. Well, it's, you see, here the, the way lambda appears it appears in a dimensionless combination with G. Well, similar object like this uh, is known for 100 years as Eddington theory of gravity. Uh, you start with first order formulation of GR in which you have metric and Levi Civita, uh, um, no, metric and, yeah, thank you, metric and Christoffel symbols, but they are uh, they're independent objects. If you integrate out the Christoffel symbols, you are back to Einstein Hilbert. If lambda is non-zero, you can also integrate out the metric, and you'll obtain the functional, which is square root of determinant of R menu. This is Eddington theory. And you'll obtain 1 over G lambda in front. So it's very, very similar to Eddington, uh, but uh, one just works with a different connection here. And then the statement is that when connections satisfy their euler lagrange equations, the metrics that I defined from connections, they will satisfy Einstein equations with non-zero lambda. Okay, uh, schematically, the way this formulation works is one defines metric as a derivative of the connection, because I told you the metric is defined from the curvature, so metric is a derivative of the connection, and there is also other components of the curvature, I'll call them F. Uh, then field equation is some second order PD on the connection, and then what happens on shell if we compute the Ricci for this metric, it's third order in the connection, clearly, because, well, it's second order in G, and therefore it's third order in the connection. And then when this field equation is satisfied, this becomes first order derivative of the connection, and therefore this is G by field equation. So you see Einstein equations arising, Ricci is equal to G. Uh -huh. uh, yes. They don't. It's the question of dimensions. Uh, if you remember the way I define the metric, it's when I introduce the conformal factor, I need to introduce some dimensionful constant there, and it's just that this is the reason why lambda appears. I, to make metric dimensionless, I need some dimensionful parameter, and this is the only reason. Uh, of course, they are independent of lambda. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Euler Lagrange equations are equations on the connection. They don't know anything about lambda, they don't care about the metric at all. It's only when you want to give this metric interpretation, then you introduce lambda. Okay, and another point about this formulation is that uh, gravitational instantons are very simple in this language. It turns out that the gravitational instanton condition is just the condition that f h f is proportional to delta, and importantly, it becomes a first order condition in this language, as for Jan Mills theory. So the claim is that uh, if 
if you have a connection satisfying this equation, SU2 connection satisfying that equation, you introduce a metric for it according to the rules I told you, and this metric is going to be anti self dual Einstein with non zero lambda. Another important fact about this formulation is that linearization is very, very simple in this language. Uh, this I don't have time to explain, but there is some complex of differential operators arising. And actually, your linearized Lagrangian is a square of, of some object. It's like Fourier Mills theory. It becomes certain differential operator of applied to connection squared. So your linearized second order uh, operator is a square of some first order operator, unlike what happens in the metric language. In particular, uh, in this formulation, there is no conformal mode problem because now Euclidean action has a sign, definite sign. And, and gravitons of particular helicity can also be introduced in the same way as we've done for Maxwell. It's just, it's just this, this equation, the first order equation on the connection give you gravitons of particular helicity. Uh, one can also study one loop behavior and, well, not surprisingly, I told you that uh, GR in metric language is one loop renormalizable with non-zero lambda. This continues to be true in this connection formulation. And the way I can write the arising beta function is that the coefficient in front of the action uh, grows logarithmically at high energies. It becomes infinite. In it. Well, it grows logarithmically, so very, very slowly. And this is the arising beta function. This is quite analogous to what I told you for Jan Mills theory. Uh, yes, yes. For other functions, uh, the story is much more complicated. I believe, but I don't have a proof, that if you start with any function, uh, the theory at one loop stays within that class. So there is some beta flow that can be written for a general function f. But GR uh, is just renormalizable. If you start with GR, you end up with GR at one loop, as, w as is the case in the metric language. Uh, OK, can you ask me this question after the talk? There is a way, but well, basically, it's via the perturbative expansion. You just can write down vertices. There is no natural. Well, there is, no, there is and there isn't, so, but we can talk about it later. It's just description of pure gravity at this level. So the summary of this connection formulation is that uh, GR becomes in many ways analogous to Jan Mills. It's not Jan Mills. Uh, it's diffeomorphism in very engaged theory, but in many ways it's analogous to Jan Mills. And what are these ways? So first of all, Lagrangian is a function of first derivatives. It's just some non-linear function of the curvature of the connection. Uh, linearized field equation, uh, the operator that arises is a square of some first order operator. Instantons is a first order condition. One loop divergence makes the coefficient in front of the action grow logarithmically with energy and increase in the UV. This is all in complete analogy with what happens in Ian Mills. The principal difference is diffeomorphism invariance and actually one can see that it's diffeomorphism invariance which makes the coupling constant to have negative mass dimension. It's just the diffeomorphism invariance that implies power counting non renormalizability This is the only difference. Of course, it's profound, important difference, but this is the only difference in this language between the two theories. The, the, well, it's not clear that one can interpret it as a coupling. It's the coefficient in front of the action that uh, goes to zero. You can explain. Yeah, you can. Like for Jan Mills. Maybe. Yes. But of course, this is, first of all, uh, G lambda, as we measure it now, is extremely small number, right? And the running is extremely weak. It's just a logarithmic running. So for all practical purposes, uh, there is no running at all. <laughs> but I, I, infrared would be defined, yeah. I, I'm afraid you will get some very strange numbers. Yeah, some crazy scales you will get. Yeah. Just because G lambda is a crazy number already. 
Okay. Uh, so one more remark about uh, negative dimension coupling constants. Actually, one should not be too scared of negative dimension coupling constants, even though it pushes you into unknown territory, non-renormalizability. But at the same time, negative mass dimension is good because it allows you to do more things. More field definitions is possible. So for some purposes, negative mass dimension coupling constants are good because then you can, you can start doing this. And uh, you, you can actually eliminate more things by, by this type of field redefinitions than is possible in any renormalizable field theories. OK, uh, let's now talk about, in the remaining two minutes, I'll quickly talk about the tulip divergence. Uh, the tulip divergence, uh, first of all, is a scary calculation. You need computers uh, to do this calculation if you start from Einstein Hilbert. This calculation was ever done just by three people in the world. Uh, this is the result. Uh, gravity, Einstein Hilbert quantum g gravity diverges at two loops. This is the rising coefficient. Uh, but there is no understanding of this number, clearly. Uh, the glimpses of understanding come from the new result by Bern of this year. He used his powerful on shell techniques to recompute this number. Uh, he can actually not just compute this number, but he can add scalar fields, two forms here, so can, he, can actually, he can do many more computations. And, but in particular, uh, it's possible by his method to add non-propagating three-form fields. This is important, and it turns out that this number changes. If you add non-propagating fields, uh, which are unphysical, uh, the divergence changes in this way. This tells you that you, the divergence, the number that you get, is actually sensitive to off-shell deals of the theory. This is not too surprising because it's a complicated calculation. So they may depend on off-shell, and this is the confirmation of that. Okay, th uh, this is important, I believe, uh, and I'll explain why this may be important in my concluding remarks. So, uh, the first message to be taken home here is that gravity is much, much closer to Jan Mills or to gauge theory than could have been anticipated from the Lagrangian. It's either Jan Mills squared on shell, or you can write it as a particular different way on gauge theory off shell with many analogies to Jan Mills. Um, gravity also behaves like Jan Mills in many ways, especially you can see it from on shell computations. And important point is that the tool behavior of gravity is very poorly understood. Uh, we have some we have a calculation which gave us non-zero result, but there is no understanding of that number that arises there. And actually, that number depends on details of off-shell continuation of your function. So can the divergence be just be an artifact of a particular off-shell version of the theory? Also, can it be artifact of particular regularization that is used? It's always DIMREC that is used. And I find very striking the fact that if you look at the details of the calculation, especially in the Bertz method, uh, the two-loop divergence comes by integrating or in momentum space, some integrand, and uh, the, com the integrand actually vanishes if you evaluate it in four dimensions. So this divergence, infinity, is actually infinity times zero. So it's some, it's some miracles of DIMRAC that are at work here, but what you're integrating, if you just evaluate it in four space-time dimensions, is actually zero. So I find this fact striking, and I would say that the tulip divergence is not understood not yet understood. We don't understand what's going on there. And so I'll conclude with some more remarks. Uh, perturbative uh, gravity used to be mass, uh, but now, well, and because it used to be mass, everybody was happy that uh, it stops making sense of two loops because you don't have to deal with this mass. But now with the new methods, um, you see that gra perturbative gravity is much less of a mess. It's actually a very beautiful theory, very th theory with lots of symmetries. And so maybe it's a time to change your frame, frame of mind. And the theory, which is in some sense most symmetric, um, should also give rise to the most beautiful quantum field theory. Uh, so maybe we just don't understand this quantum field theory. Maybe we don't have proper language, proper description of it. Maybe uh, these results push us in that direction. And I'll finish with a question. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the key point about gravity is diffeomorphism invariance. And 
if you write any theory which is diffeomorphism invariant, it will contain gravity in it. So the, it seems to me that the real question of quantum gravity is, can one write some diffeomorphism invariant theory which makes sense as a QFT? And if yes, then that will be that will contain quantum gravity in it. And I'll stop here. Questions? I have two questions, in fact. The, the first one is, um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, you mentioned this, this uh, formulation of Young Mills. It looks like it's a mixed formulation from this uh, uh, trivalent formulation, if you can yes. put it back. So it contains one, one factor is F, that yeah. just previously, and the other one is N. Yes. So here you did, let's replace F by N and you yeah. get gravity. So what is the theory you get if you replace N by F? Uh, it's a scalar field theory with uh, scalar and that is charged under two different gauges. So some kind of a and, yeah, and it's, it's and a known it's a known theory. It's known and yeah. the action is also simple. Yeah, it's f cubic interaction. So it's this one would be in some sense uh, more fundamental theory. Uh, yes, yes, but it wouldn't have diffeomorphism invariance. No, it, it, it would not have behavior. If you list, for example, under these BCFW shifts, it wouldn't. Uh, the amplitudes wouldn't go to zero at infinity. It would be not as nice theory as GR. But it's an interesting it's one. Yeah, yeah, people, of course, peop, people study this doubling trick now. Mm -hmm. This is the basic example they start from. Okay. So uh, another question is about locality here. Because, mm -hmm. because you, I mean, because you deal with just pure gravity, you mm -hmm. don't have to answer the question of Pat Madaban. Like, you know, you have a space time, but, but uh, you don't have to, to really understand, and especially when you go to this, uh, I Young Mills formulation. I mean, mm -hmm. in some sense, it's a formulation where locality is completely dissolved, and of course, locality usually is, you know, how. You mean to this on-shell formulations, if you go. Well, no, no. This uh, I'm more thinking a your your your. F wedge of, F. Yeah, the, when, when you go to the to the F formulation, mm -hmm. you know, this. Mo I mean, in some sense, locality appears in when you you start to ask how does the space-time couples to matter, right? And mm -hmm. you can imagine now that you're in this young Mills formulation, right. some natural coupling from the young Mills point of view. But when rewritten in terms of a metric, they will be horrendously non-local. So the so way I can answer which, which is okay. Yeah, which is good. I mean, in some sense, you know, the only way you could make sense of gravity mm -hmm. is, is by having non-locality. The way I'm thinking about coupling to meta, thank you for the question. The way I'm thinking about coupling to meta is there are two possible perspectives. One is fundamental way. And in the fundamental way, you just allow your gauge group to be larger, and then you see what that theory describes. This is a way to couple some meta to GR. This is one way. Another way is effective. You expand your GR Lagrangian around a particular background, and then I can easily write down uh, interaction vertices with meta. Uh, and it will be the usual interaction between stress energy tensor and meta. So that, that I can also do. It's complicated, yeah. yeah. That route, I, I'm not prepared to go because it changes the order of field equations. Uh, field equations become higher than second order, so this I'm uncomfortable with. I, I won't. Yeah, there is certainly that way as well. Yeah, you can just introduce that metric and couple it. Matter in the usual way, but using that metric. But as I said, this, this is not a nice theory. Oh. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I take the point, yes. Uh, there is a way of seeing links between scattering amplitudes for young mills and gravity when you use the formal is when you introduce the two historical realizations of the, of the mo in momentum space. I mean, uh, you, 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 didn't, you didn't comment at all. And uh, of course, there is a whole story going story on in this direction. Yeah. And is it, do you have uh, some special attitude toward this 
Oxford approach or? or uh, uh, no, I don't think that is too relevant for my talk, so I wouldn't mention it. So, with respect to other approach in the past, like the one by WeCheck, uh, that was uh, assuming a different philosophy, like, I mean, having some uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, but was, and also encoding a deep relationship with the uh, Jan Mills, so, I mean, gravity and Jan Mills. Uh, what do you think, why uh, this is, we should prefer this, or which are the differences, or which are the... Well, I don't know in too much detail that approach, so maybe you can tell me about it and I, I can tell you differences and similarities. Oh, okay, thank you.